You're bothered inside yourself. You have the chance right now to do the right thing or do the wrong thing. Is that the soul's warning system? Welcome to The Pondering, a Fathom Ministries production. So what is the soul's warning system? Every one of us, believer or non-believer, Jew or Gentile, have this thing inside of us to where we get in situations on a daily basis and we have the ability, based on that feeling, the soul's warning system, to either do the right thing or to do the wrong thing in any given situation. Now this is called the conscience. Now every human being has a conscience man or woman, Jew or Gentile, believer or unbeliever. Now, God has purposely given this to us inside of us. It is a invisible attribute given to us by a holy, righteous God to keep us accountable in our morality, both spiritual and physical. Now, what exactly is the conscience? Now, you might have seen in movies where a man or a woman, they have a uh, <laughs> on their right shoulder, they have an angel that appears. When they're in a sticky situation, they don't know what to do. The angel appears and he goes, Oh, uh, I would not do that if I was you. Um, you know better. And then a devil shows up on their left shoulder. It's like, come on, do the thing you want to do. You will like it. And then the person's going back and forth. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And eventually he or she gives into one of those things. You've all seen these in movies and cartoons and television shows where they're pondering, which way do I go? Do I do the right thing? Do I listen to the angel on my right shoulder? Or do I listen to the demon, the devil on my left shoulder? Well, this is kind of what the conscience is actually real like. Now, there is a scripture <laughs> that I'm going to go to right now that actually kind of defines what I just said. So Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 21 says, And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. <laughs> that sounds exactly like what I just said. The angel on the right shoulder and the devil on the left shoulder. Both of these are talking at the same time. Do the right thing. Don't do it. No, do the wrong thing. Do it. Rebel against God. No, don't rebel against God. And the person has to choose which one. Let me read that again. And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Now, right now, the soul's warning system is going off. Now, the believer, the one who is filled with the Holy Spirit, the born again believer, the conscience is supposed to be in subjection with the Holy Spirit. Now, the conscience itself is not the law of God, but it's supposed to be in subjection to the Holy Spirit that is empowering the believer for his daily walk. Now, the conscience will give him a right standing with God if it is clear, or he'll have a guilty feeling before God. Now, let me give you an example. So the born again believer, let's say he's caught up in um, pornography. He looks once, he looks twice, he looks three times. And now his conscience is starting to bother him. He realizes, oh man, I can't be looking at this stuff. God is not pleased with this. I'm called to be pure. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. I shall abstain from sexual immorality. My conscience is bothering me because the conscience is supposed to be in subjection to the Holy Spirit's will. Now, the born again believer filled with the Holy Spirit is not going to be able to get away with this. Now, if, if the believer is looking at pornography or is doing some kind of sin and the conscience is bothered, this is a good thing. Now, the believer with a clear conscience who's not looking at pornography, who's not living in sin, will have a right standing relationship with God. He'll feel guilt free. Now, but the backslidden Christian who's fallen once or twice and three times, now his conscience is really bothering him. His Holy Spirit through his conscience is letting him know, this is not what I have for you. I do not want you to be in subjection to slavery, to sin. I want you to come out and be separate, says the Lord. His conscience is going to be bothered by him. Now he's going to feel in a way cut off from God. He's going to feel ashamed when he opens his Bible. When, when another Christian comes up to him to talk about the things of the Lord, he's going to kind of shy back a little bit. He's going to feel 
awkward. Why? Because he has a bothered conscience. It's not clear. Now let's go to scripture right now. And Paul is in a situation where he is describing how his conscience is clear before the Lord. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 12 says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction which occurred in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who rescued us from so great a danger of death, and will rescue us. He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us, if you also join in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons in our behalf for the favor granted to us through the prayers of many. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. Paul was enjoying the fruits of having a clear conscience before God. His conscience was clear. He was not caught or bound up in any sin. He had a right standing relationship, pure, undefiled, a holy, pure conscience toward God. Now, that's the kind of conscience that a believer, when his conscience is in subjection to the Holy Spirit, should have on a daily basis with the Lord. Now, the conscience is the soul's warning system. Remember, it's not the law of God itself, but it is supposed to be in subjection to the Holy Spirit's will. Now, when a believer has a right standing relationship like Paul, like I just read, his proud confidence was this, the testimony of his conscience. So now he can come boldly to the throne room of grace and ask the Lord for anything in his time of need. With a clear conscience, he has 100% confidence that the Lord will hear him, that he's not cut off from the Lord. Now, let me clarify. If you're a believer, you are not cut off from the Lord, even if you're a backslider. But if you have a guilty conscience or a dirty conscience, you will feel like you are temporarily cut off until you repent, confess of your sin, and turn back to the Lord and start walking in obedience to him. A clear conscience is what the believer has on a daily basis to know if his relationship with the Lord is in right standing or if there's something in his life either that day or that he does on a daily basis that is bothering him, that makes him feel disconnected to the Lord. Believe me, I've had a lot of days in my Christian walk where I was in a season of temporarily backsliding or I was doing things that displeased the Lord and my conscience, I wasn't, I wasn't bothered enough by it. And I didn't really know what was going on when I'd feel guilty for something when I thought this was okay. But the Lord was telling me, no, I don't want you living like this. And the soul's warning system was going off inside of me. Alert, alert, alert. You're living in this sin and I want you to come out of that and be separate. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 24 right now, verse 1 through 10. We're going to read a little bit about David, King David of Israel. When he's on the run from King Saul, he did something that bothered his conscience. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. So right here, David's conscience is bothered. He cut a piece of Saul's robe off. Now, when it says Saul went to the bathroom to relieve himself, what he was actually doing, <laughs> he was using the bathroom in a squatting down position. I'm not going to elaborate, but you know what's going on right there. And David was bothered in his conscience, even though his men were saying, this is the time that the Lord has given you to overtake your enemy. 
In verse 10, you'll find out why his conscience was bothered right here. Let's keep reading. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Verse 10, behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now, right here in verse 10, David is giving us the explanation of why his conscience bothered him. There is no way he wanted to strike and kill the Lord's anointed. David is informed by the Lord that he is the king in waiting. But right now, King Saul, even though rejected by the Lord of Israel, the God Yahweh, David is on the run from Saul, even though Saul has had the Holy Spirit taken away from him. And now he's sent a tormenting spirit by the Lord. Why? Because Saul did not love the Lord from his heart and disobeyed the Lord several times in front of the kingdom of Israel. Therefore, profaning the name of the Lord. And now the Lord has taken the Holy Spirit which was a temporary thing in the Old Testament, by the way. It wasn't a permanent resident like it is in the New Testament under the era of grace that we're now living in. So David's conscience bothered him by cutting a piece off the robe of King Saul. Now, probably because he was baited by his friends and for a moment he set aside his conscience and he went after to maybe disgrace or to shame King Saul saying, ha ha, you're not watching me. I can kill you if I wanted to right now. I'm going to cut off a piece of your robe and flaunt it to you. But King David, whatever the reason was in verse 10, it's clear. He did not want to strike the Lord's anointed because to him that would bother his conscience. Now to these men, if they were to strike King Saul, it might not bother their conscience, but to David, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, it bothered him. Why? Because his conscience was in subjection with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was letting him know, I don't want you doing that. This is the Lord's anointed. That's why David got bothered by it. Now let's go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter three, verse one through 11. Now this is the first time the Bible talks about the soul's warning system. It is a fascinating story. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, this point, Adam and Eve were innocent. No sin or rebellion has yet occurred. So all they know is from their created state. God created them as innocent creatures. But as we find out, God in his foreknowledge and his omniscience and his brilliance gave the first humans, Adam and Eve, a conscience the woman was convinced she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. <laughs> so at this time, their eyes were open and they knew they were naked and ashamed. The soul's warning system went off and God in his brilliance put inside the human beings 
a conscience. Now, God had to have known they were going to do this and rebel. Why did he know this? Because he created human beings with the tendency to rebel. Now, why would God create creatures that have the tendency to rebel? God is seeking true worshipers, not robots. So he, if he made Adam and Eve with the ability to not rebel, to not sin and go their own way and reject God, well, great, let's just make robots that do everything we say. Yes, sir. No, sir. Right away, sir. That don't have the capacity to truly love. But here, Adam and Eve, their eyes were open. They went from innocent to a guilty feeling all of a sudden. They knew they were naked and they were ashamed. Let's read on. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Okay, so right here, they're ashamed and they're hiding from the Lord. This was the opposite that happened only a few moments ago. A few moments ago, they were innocent. They had a right standing relationship with God. They ate of the fruit of the tree they were not supposed to, the one tree. Remember, the Lord made them with the ability to rebel against him and the tendency to rebel. So the eyes were open of both of them and they knew they were naked and they were ashamed. And not only that, they ran from the Lord at this point. So now they have a guilty conscience before the Lord. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden. So I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Again, their conscience is letting them know that now that they're naked and they're ashamed of their nakedness. So they're hiding from the presence of the Lord right now. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? <laughs> so their conscience is bothered. Their eyes are open. Now they went from an innocent, right standing relationship in the presence of God to feeling convicted, condemned, cut off from the right standing relationship to God. Now they're ashamed at their nakedness. And now they're hiding because they're ashamed of their nakedness because their conscience is severely bothered now. Now I'm going to go to chapter two in Genesis verse 23 through 24. So a little before what I just read in chapter three, this is what it says. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Oh, did you see that? They felt no shame at this point because earlier chapter two, the Lord is presenting every animal and every creature to Adam. Now, Adam at this point is naming every animal and creature, but he finds no suitable helper for himself. So the Lord causes a deep sleep to come over Adam. And then the Lord takes one of Adam, Adam's ribs and forms a woman out of it. Adam wakes up and is excited, ecstatic to see a woman there. She was probably very beautiful to him, but they came from him. So now... Adam and Eve, which is man and woman, are together and united. And now it says they were naked and not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? They had a right standing relationship with God. They had a clear conscience, even though they had no idea what a conscience was. But the Lord in his brilliance put inside the human beings a conscience, which is invisible, by the way. The greatest attributes... <laughs> Two of the best attributes inside of humans are the conscience and love. These are both things that every human has and experiences, yet you, they cannot be traced or tracked or seen inside of the human body, which is the brilliance of God. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter four, that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts of the intentions of the heart. The soul and the spirit are both invisible attributes. It cuts through the invisibility of the soul and the spirit. The word of God penetrates you. That's kind of what 
love and the conscience are. These are invisible things, attributes, qualities that the humans have and experience, yet an atheist or an unbeliever, a skeptic, they can't tell you why human beings, if there's no God, if there's not a moral right and wrong, if there's not a God who is a creative God who creates everything, if there's not a God that loves his creation and that has a moral right st- or right and wrong standard, they can't explain why every human being has a conscience that bothers them if they're doing wrong or why they have the love, the feeling of love towards people. A man has a love for a woman as an invisible attribute purposely put there by God himself that you cannot see or explain. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter three, verses 20 through 22. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. Knowing both good and evil, Adam and Eve in their innocent state, when they had a right standing relationship before God in his presence, before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, before they rebelled and disobeyed God from their heart intentionally. Now they have a guilty conscience. The brilliance of God here is, is that mankind has the soul's warning system inside of himself. Most human beings will think twice before stealing. Most human beings will think twice three, four, five, six times and won't commit murder. Some human beings, a lot of human beings will not commit adultery on their spouses. Now, why is that? If there was no conscience, if there was no moral sense of right and wrong or a sense of fear and punishment, if I do bad as opposed to doing right, then there would be chaos throughout the world and man at his core in his heart is wicked man would just wipe out man from the face of the earth quickly because there's no feeling of any kind of consequence, no right and wrong inside of them. So now let's go to Romans chapter two, verse 12 through 15. Now I'm going to talk to you about all people having a conscience now, not just the believer, but also the unbeliever. When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it without even having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. And this is the message I proclaim that the day is coming when God through Christ Jesus will judge everyone's secret life. Whoa, there's a lot to unpack here. So Jews who have the law of God will be judged under the law. Gentiles, who is everybody that's not a Jew, will be judged outside the law if they've never heard the law of God. Now, the conscience, this is the brilliance of God. He has put a conscience in both the Jew and the Gentile, the believer and the non-believer. It says right here, let me read it again. Verse 14. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. So most people will actually obey God's law without having no idea what they're talking about. You shall not murder. Most human beings know in their conscience, they're not going to commit murder. You shall not steal. A lot of people who have never heard of the law of God instinctively inside themselves know that it is wrong to murder and it is wrong to steal. Where does that come from? The Lord in his brilliance has put the conscience inside of every human. They have God's written law in their heart, on their conscience, obeying it 
or not obeying it. Let's read verse 15 one more time. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. If they think about stealing, their conscience will warn them, you shouldn't do that. That's God's warning system. If they think about picking up a knife or a gun and shooting or stabbing somebody, the conscience, you shall not do that. They know nothing about God. They hate God. They blaspheme God. They slander God. Their lifestyle lives opposite of what God has for humans. They hate God, yet in their conscience, the soul's warning system put there by God on purpose so most people will not do heinous things. Now, people can sear their conscience but this is also the brilliance of God. God, to restrain societies from going cuckoo and out of control and mass murdering and doing heinous things and ruining societies and countries, has also given us another kind of conscience. Societies have a physical conscience that they can see in government and law enforcement, a kind of restrainer. So let's go to Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anybody who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. This is the beauty of God, establishing governments and law enforcement. This is to keep people in check. This is also a kind of conscience. Now, the conscience in a human being, when he thinks about murdering somebody, the conscience, the soul's warning system is going to go off and say, you shouldn't murder that person. That's wrong. Even though they hate God and don't know anything about God's law, it's written on their hearts and their conscience is either accusing or defending their actions. Law enforcement is the same thing. That's a kind of a conscience. The human being, knowing that there's law enforcement, that there's cops, police officers, he sees a person's house, wants to break into that house, wants to take his goods, will think twice. Why? Because the owner might have a gun or he might get arrested and thrown in jail. That is a restraint. When somebody sears their own conscience, there's a second, a different kind of conscience, law enforcement, which is the beauty of God, not trusting, not trusting human beings to go off their, the soul's warning system just by itself. He, he's put restrainers in societies, in governments and law enforcements. It, God is just perfect in wisdom. Let's go to John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25 real quick. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. <laughs> no one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. The point of reading that scripture is this. Jesus, the Lord himself, knows what's inside every human's heart. And the conscience is the soul's warning system. So the Lord knows that not everybody is going to obey their conscience, that some people are going to sear their conscience like with a hot branding iron. They're just going to shut out the soul's warning system and not listen to it. So they'll do what they want and think they can get away with it. But by the beauty of God, he has put law enforcement and government to be the restrainer on societies. What I just read, Jesus was not entrusting himself to human beings so because he knew what was inside every human's heart. He knew and he knows not everybody's going to listen to their conscience and some people are going to sear it and they're just going to say, I am going to murder. I am going to steal. The beauty of God is he has set up law enforcement <laughs> and governments to take down these kind of people. I love it. Now, the book of James chapter four, verse 17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Now for this individual believer, it is sin. Now, James chapter one is all about talking about the flesh and the trials of the flesh. James chapter two is talking about people judging other people based on their material wealth. Chapter three of the book of James is talking about taming the tongue, the evils of the tongue from the tongue, both come blessing and cursing. Now in chapter four, it's talking about selfishness and envy 
toward other believers, towards other people. Now, the culmination of these four chapters comes down to verse 17 in chapter 4. Now, let's reread it. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, each person is not going to feel guilty in their conscience about the same things. So right there it says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Each individual believer or non-believer will be and is accountable to God. Now, each one has to have his conscience in subjection under the Holy Spirit's authority. I'm talking about the believer now. So what might bother one Christian might not bother another. Each one has to work out his own salvation in fear and trembling. This is the beauty of God. Each person can live in his own right standing relationship to God under the subjection of the Holy Spirit that lives inside him. The conscience is under subjection to the Holy Spirit. Now, what might bother some people will not might not bother others. Now, let me take you to an example of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, yes, we know we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So, what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god, and that there is only one god. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created, and for whom we live, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. Stop right there. So these Christians, these brand new baby Christians, these born again Christians are coming out of an environment where Meat were sacrificed to pagan idols, and this was the custom, and this was the lifestyle that they were accustomed to. When they became a believer in Christ, and the Holy Spirit came to live in their heart, and they were a born-again believer, when they were put in a situation, even though a Christian might have meat in front of them, they might be bothered by that because they're not sure in their conscience if this meat has been sacrificed to idols or not, because they came out of that lifestyle. So on the one hand, the one person might have meat in front of him, and he is not bothered at all because he was not accustomed to that lifestyle. Or maybe he was and he came out of it, but his conscience isn't bothered. But the weak baby new born-again believer comes to dine at his table, and he has a piece of meat set in front of him ready to eat. He might hear or he might just suspect that this meat was offered and sacrificed to idols and his conscience might bother him. So that's enough reason for him to be bothered by it and not want to eat the meat, even though the brother next to him is not bothered. Let's go back and read James chapter four, verse 17 one more time. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. So right here, the story of One Christian is eating meat, not with a bothered conscience, with a clear conscience. Another Christian is is about to eat meat, but with a bothered conscience. You see, one Christian might not be bothered by this, but the other is. Each one is to purpose then in his own heart, because the believer is supposed to have his conscience in subjection under the Holy Spirit's power. Let's continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 8. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat, and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food? that has been offered to an idol. So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. 
And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Wow, let me reread verse 12. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. Wow, so you who have superior knowledge, who have been a Christian for a while, who knows scripture, and who is farther along in your walk with Christ, you eat next to the weaker Christian, the new Christian, the baby Christian, the one who for whom Christ died. If you try to entice your brother because to eat the meat that you are in a place where he feels uncomfortable or a meal which violates his conscience, you are actually sinning against Christ. Ooh, that's a scary thing. Even though your conscience is clear and you can eat meat, sacrificed to idols in an idol's temple itself, the weaker baby Christian, who now is a born again believer in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, he has a problem with this because his conscience is bothered, but yours isn't. If you entice him to join you, you're actually sinning against Christ. That's what that says. And you don't want to be in that predicament. Remember, to him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So what's good for one believer might not be good for the other. What you have a clear conscience about might cause the other believer to have a guilty conscience. And it says at the end of the chapter, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble or if it causes him to have a guilty conscience, I will never eat meat again. Now, Romans chapter 14, verse 23 says, But the one who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. It's the same concept. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 says, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. Each believer will be filled up with love, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. If a believer has a clear conscience before God, they're going to be able to walk in their daily life free and clear from guilt, having a right standing relationship with God, having nothing hindering them, having no baggage, not being caught up in any sin, not being ashamed to talk about the Lord because they're backsliding, not be ashamed because they're looking at pornography. And now when they open the scriptures, God isn't speaking to them as clearly as he used to, because now there is a severed relationship between God. They're saved. This is not a salvation issue, but the soul's warning system is going off. Something is wrong. Their spiritual and moral conduct are at jeopardy at this point. Let's wake up every day and pray to the Lord right when we get up and let's have our thoughts and our minds and our consciences line up with God's will for the day for us. We want to have a right standing relationship on a daily basis before the Lord. If we're caught up in any sin, let's repent, let's forsake it, and let's get a clear conscience before the Lord. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Uh, the conscience is something I've always wondered about and I've always wondered in certain situations or something I've done, why am I being bothered by this? Why do I feel like there's a warning system going off and I don't feel I have a close relationship with the Lord right now? The conscience is the soul's warning system, remember. And if you violate your conscience, it's going to go off. If it's clear it's going to let you know, hey, do your thing. Go about your daily walk with the Lord because you have nothing to be ashamed of. You're not naked and ashamed <laughs> as Adam and Eve were. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for allowing me to do this study and to teach others and myself about the conscience, something I really haven't known much about doesn't talk about it a whole lot, but it talks about it enough in great detail when it does talk about it to understand what it is and that every human has a conscience and that somebody can do the right thing or the wrong thing on a daily basis. And thank you for giving us the soul's warning system. And 
to every believer out there who doesn't understand the conscience or is a new convert and their, uh, their, their conscience is not in subjection under the Holy Spirit's authority right now. I pray that they will be led to seek the Lord, seek you and your strength, and that you teach them all your truths. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us on our Fathom Ministries podcast. If this ministry has been beneficial to you and your walk with the Lord, please consider a monthly donation to our ministry effort by clicking on the donate button in the description of this video or podcast. To find out more about Fathom Ministries Church, please join us at fathomministrieschurch.com. Thank you for listening and supporting this ministry.